Well, good morning, Reformation Baptist Church. I'm sorry you guys have to get me instead of Pastor Brandon, but, you know, most everybody got the word. That's why it's so empty in here. That's usually how it goes. You guys apparently didn't get the memo. So um, the title of my sermon today is Do Not Muzzle an Ox When It Treads Out the Grain. It's a strange thing to title a sermon, but it'll make sense by the end, I hope. So what I want to do is this, this, this idea of not muzzling an ox when it treads out the grain, Paul uses it twice in the New Testament, and he's using it to talk about a specific thing that I'm going to talk about. But more than that, the way that the Apostle Paul pulls from the Old Testament, and specifically the law of Moses, and applies it into a New Testament setting and just does it and, and, and without qualification or anything else, shows us this principle of assuming continuity between the Old and New Testament and the Old and New Covenant. Okay? And so that's going to be a, 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 a concept that I'm going to try and drive home. And then um, we'll close out um, with really, I guess, the thrust of the sermon. So, all right, let's get started. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Verses 1 through 14, the Apostle Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more. He continues, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So that is one instance of that concept in Corinthians. And then when he's writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, in the first letter, chapter 5, 17 and 18, he says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So this concept of not muzzling an ox when it treads out the grain applies directly to one of the reasons we should be sacrificially giving, but I believe it also has a theological underpinning of assuming continuity and pulling the general equity from the Old Testament law and reasserting it in the New Testament and the New Covenant. And what it means, if you guys haven't figured it out from going through all of that, if you muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, what he's saying is, is you should pay people who work for you, who do, who do labor that you benefit from. You need to pay them. And most directly, in both of these instances, he's talking about paying a pastor for the labors that they, from the studying, the teaching, the shepherding, and all of these things, that we should pay them. And so that, that's a direct point that I want to make, but... 
that, that pay comes from the church and the church gets its money from the congregation. And I'm going to use this concept of pulling from the Old Testament, assuming continuity to tell you guys what I believe is how much we should be giving and why. But before we get into that, uh, I'll continue. So first, Paul is, to, is directly teaching the fact that those whose lives are devoted to the gospel and the study and preaching of God's word are worthy of double honor and to be paid for their labor. This could not be more clear. We at Reformation Baptist Church are unbelievably blessed to have a pastor who is completely devoted to not only the study and preaching of God's word, but also completely dedicated to the shepherding of his flock. In these dark days, that is a rare, rare thing. I've never seen a pastor who works harder, both in study and in the care of the souls that God has entrusted with him. The scriptures are clear that faithful ministers are to be compensated by the church, and for us, that should be a joy. So undergirding these statements on pastoral compensation is the Apostle Paul's repeated use of the general equity of Old Testament law as it applies to muzzling an ox when it treads out the grain. I'll read it again. It says, Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? That's key. Does not the law say the same? So there he is, the Apostle Paul. In the New Testament, pointing back to the law of Moses in the Old Testament, and says, For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And he goes on to say, Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It is written for our sake, because on and on it goes. God is not worried about the oxen. I mean, he is, but... But the principle that is being taught is for us, right? For, for, for humans, uh, for his people. And so um, Paul takes that and applies it. So assuming continuity between the old and the new, Paul doesn't refer to the law of Moses and say, well, we know that that was done away with and it doesn't really matter anymore, but it's a really good principle that we could go ahead and use in the New Testament too. No, he refers to the law of Moses as though it has authority, as though it has authority, because it does. This idea that the Old Testament, as well as the law of God, are somehow done away with in, an, in the New Covenant is not biblical, nor is it historical. What do I mean by it's not historical? The church, for thousands of years, never taught this until about 1830, this idea of the abrogation of all three um, distinctions of the law. And we're going to go into that. So, um, real quick. So, uh, yeah. So the um, it's and, and what it's called is antinomianism, and I've preached on that before uh, at length. But it's this idea: as we live as though there is no law. It's a standardless Christianity that produces no fruit because there are no standards. Christ doesn't call us, save us, change our hearts for us to continue on as pagans. He gives us a target in his law in a sense of saying this is the standard. And when he gives us a new heart, our heart now loves that standard and pursues it. So, so you guys have heard me preach on this multiple times as well. A lot of stuff I like to review just to put it back in front of you because everything builds. It's like building blocks. You learn this concept and you're like, oh, okay. And then you take the next building block and you put it on it, you put it on it, put it on it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, that's where this is coming from. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. When Paul wrote this to Timothy, there was no New Testament. Again, this is review for you guys. I've taught on this before. So if there was no New Testament and Paul says all scripture, what is he talking about? The Old Testament. And so the Apostle Paul is saying that the Old Testament was breathed out by God 
And the Old Testament is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, and that the Old Testament uh, will help the man of God be complete and equipped for every good work. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul in what is now the New Testament points us to the Old Testament for instruction, then he pulls from the Old Testament to give us a biblical principle for taking care of our pastor. Another way the early church fathers have described it is this. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Point being, in all of this, we shouldn't look at the first two-thirds of the, the Bible with, like, squinty-eyed suspicion, you know? And uh, I think that that's something that's happened uh, in this modern church context. We open our Bible. We spend 80% of our time in the New Testament. We look back at the Old Testament. And it's like, that's kind of weird. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But, but none of it makes any sense, right? The New Testament can't make sense without the Old Testament. And the Old Testament actually doesn't make sense like the, without the New Testament. The two are in God's divine providence. He puts them both together so that we can understand both. <clears throat> God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of his characteristics is that he is uh, immutable. And so when you go over the attributes of God or the characteristics of God and your studies on those things, which you should, one of the primary attributes of God is his immutability. What that means is that he is unchanging. He is not like us. We change. He does not. And so if God is saying something in the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, He's not just going to completely abandon ship and say, that was actually a really terrible idea. I'm sorry about that, guys, but I got this new thing, right? Like, that's not how God operates. So what is general equity? Well, we need to break down the threefold division of God's law. There were three laws or a threefold division of laws in the Old Testament, there's the moral law, which remains in its complete fullness, which is the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. There's the civil law, which was Israel's civil code. And our confession says that that remains, the general equity of that law remains. And then the ceremonial law uh, is abrogated or done away with because there are no sacrifices left to sacrifice. So we don't need instructions on how to slaughter the goat and where to splatter its blood, right? So the moral law, the Decalogue, Deca, 10, see, we're learning today. The Decalogue, 10, 10 commandments is the moral law. In the 10 commandments, there are two tables, two tables in God's law. The first table is summed up by Jesus Christ is love God. So the first four commandments, the first table you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any carved image. You shall not use the, Lord, the, the Lord's name in vain and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is love God. This is the first table. The second table is love neighbor. So you have in the law, love of God and love of neighbor. The next six commandments in the second table, honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. So the Decalogue is summed up as love God, love neighbor. All 10 of those commandments remain with full authority for us today. And that's how God tells us what we should be striving for. So the civil law, Israel's civil code, it is case law used to govern the affairs of the citizens of Old Testament Israel. Examples, Deuteronomy 22. Just like you guys should definitely do this because there's so much wisdom in it, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun it's a fun read when you start to understand how God's law works, what the purpose of it is. Because I remember the first time I went through Deuteronomy, I was just like, what is this? But then once you under, kind of begin to understand the threefold division of the law, moral law, civil law, ceremonial law, what the purposes were, how does it apply? And you begin to realize that all of these laws that Israel followed, it was just case law basically saying like, in order for Israel to function as a society, this is how, you know, uh, citizens of Israel should behave. And what it ultimately is saying is, 
in this community, in this time, in this culture, this is what it looks like to love God and love neighbor in a society. And so then it gives you case law on how to do that or how you should do that with punishments attached uh, to it. So an example, Deuteronomy 22, 1 through 5. Well, 1 through 4 is this one and then 5. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you and you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him and you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or any other lost thing of your brother's which he loses and you find. You may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. And so it's really clear what this is saying. Like, and, and, and to most people in today's society, this would not apply. But we live in Elmore County. And so actually, if you see your neighbor's cow, you should probably help him out, right? So it still kind of, still kind of applies. You know, I actually remember reading this and I lived in Macon County. <laughs> In Gilmore County, anyway, Macon County. And uh, I had a Muslim neighbor with goats, and they would always get out. And I found myself wanting to uh, ignore them. But I realized, no, no, I gotta, gotta go wrestle this goat and bring it back to my neighbor. Again, pride doesn't apply to most people across the country, but here we are, and it does. Here's one that applies to everybody. You guys ready? A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. A couple definitions we're going to go through here just for fun. A woman shall not wear a man's garment. This word garment means regalia. Okay, Regalia is the way that a man would dress when he goes to war. In his fullest, most masculine sense, a man who is dressed, his loins are girded for battle, he is ready for war, and is saying that it's an abomination for a woman to be dressed in battle regalia. It's not talking about merely putting on the clothes. It's talking about what, like, it's, it's this idea, and again, it's where I personally don't think um, women should be on the front lines of war taking bullets. I believe that that's an abomination, okay? And, and I think God thinks that too. But more applicable to everyday life here in this world, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. And so this is taking on the appearance, but also the effeminate posture of a woman. This is an abomination, I think we all understand that. I don't think there's going to be a lot of argument in this room about that. But the other thing that you guys need to understand is what does the term abomination mean? Abomination. We think, because we're in Alabama, that abomination is the thing that the, you know, the independent fundamentalist Baptist pastor with the suspenders on slams his fist down and says, guys, you're an abomination. Right? And it's like, okay, I'm not sure what that means, but yeah. No, that word abomination is a huge, huge, meaningful word. Abomination is a sin that gets into the earth, air, and water. It's a pollutant, okay? And so when God calls something an abomination, what that means is it will destroy your society. We're, we got all these environmentalists that are worried about chemicals getting into our water and, and stuff like that. And I'm one that isn't real big on Roundup going into our stuff. But we, we understand this idea of something polluting it and then it causing harm to all these households, right? God is saying this type of sin, this type of wickedness is an abomination. And then it actually gets into the earth, the water, and the air, so it begins to spread, and then your society begins to deteriorate. Can we see that? Is that not crystal clear? Not what I was preaching on today, but I figured let's go over it because there it is in the text. Okay, so Israel's civil code, civil law, can be summed up as what does loving God and loving neighbor look like in ancient Israel as it pertains to the rules that govern their society? So it was case law for those people at that time, but it was taking God's moral law and saying, what does it look like for these people in this culture at that time to love God and love neighbor? What does that look like? <clears throat> so the general equity of that law remains, and we'll get into the definition of general equity. 
So ceremonial law, that's the laws that govern how sacrifices were made by Levitical priests. Think about the laws that instructed the priest to gut certain animals and burn the fat and dispense with certain portions of the sacrifice or splatter blood on the altar so many times, etc. These were, in fact, done away with or abrogated as Christ is the once for all propitiation. He was the ultimate sacrifice that all Old Testament sacrifices pointed to. There are no more sacrifices, therefore there is no need for ceremonial law. In both of the major historic Reformed confessions, the London Baptist Confession of 1689, that you guys read all the time and know backwards and forwards, right? Because it's our confession, everybody? Everybody? Okay. That is our confession. That is what we hold to. That is what we sign up when we join this church, that we're going to submit to that confession. But then also uh, another big Reformed confession is the Westminster Confession of Faith. In both of these historic Reformed confession, it is taught that the general equity of Israel's civil code still applies today and that the wisdom found in Israel's civil code should be used by those crafting laws today. Do you think those guys in Montgomery are reading Deuteronomy when they're going to make a law? Something tells me probably not. So, um, here's a for instance in how you would take an Old Testament law, case law, civil law, and apply it to today. And by the way, our entire legal system, Sam can attest to this, he just graduated law school, our entire legal system is based on Israel's civil code and English common law. That's our entire legal system. Well, you're, we're not a Christian nation, there's deists, and they're like, oh, okay, well, we just based our entire legal system off the Bible, but yeah, other than that. But anyway, I have a rabbit trail problem. So back to it. In Deuteronomy 22.8, says this, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. You guys need to go home and put a parapet on your house. Well, no. Again, Israel's civil code was for those people at that time in that culture. But the general equity of that is that you're responsible for the safety and well-being of the of guests on your property. So in, in Israel, a parapet, everyone, it would get so hot that they would have to go to the roofs in the evening to cool off. And that's where everyone gathered. It was like the living room in Israel was your roof. And so if you had guests over, you would go to the roof and you would hang out on the roof and, you know, talk about football or whatever. Just kidding. But so you're on the roof and, and, and it says that you, so because of that, in that culture at that time for those people, it said that when you build a new house, you have to put up a parapet. A parapet is a railing, just like on your porch. If you ever been to someone's porch, like that doesn't have a railing and you're like, Ugh. right? And so it's saying you have to have that. And, and the reason is if someone falls off of your house when they're hanging out on your roof and they die, blood guilt is upon you, meaning you're guilty of manslaughter. So what is the general equity of that is that, you, that, that we have taken our society when we formed real estate laws is that you are responsible if someone trips on the sidewalk that's on your property that's messed up that you didn't fix and they break their leg, guess who's responsible? If someone's on your property and you don't have a, a, a railing on your deck and they fall off and die, guess whose fault it is? Well, where did this idea come from? It comes from Israel's civil code because God, God says that that is what is right and just. And so we should pull from that wisdom as we make laws for today. And we did that for about 200 years and then went off the, you know, off the, off the rails. So this concept of general equity is a great example of assuming continuity between the old and new. And so the picture I'm trying to paint to you guys is to get rid of this, this linear division between the Old and New Testaments and realize that it's actually, you can preach Revelation out of Genesis and you can preach Genesis out of Revelation and there's lines that go across the whole thing that you can hang the whole of Scripture on. It's one story, okay? That's the biggest thing that I'm trying to hammer home here um, before I roll into, um, well, we'll get to it. So, <clears throat> covenant structure. Blessings and cursings. Some folks don't like the term cursing, 
So you could say covenant consequences, okay? But the key to this is that there is no neutral, okay? If you obey, you are blessed. If you disobey, you are cursed or you will receive covenant consequences. If you are a baptized believer and you are in covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and you are living in a way that's consistent with him and you're doing your best, not perfect, but covenant, it's called covenant faithfulness. You're faithful, you fall short, you repent, but you're living a life of faithful obedience to the word of God, doing your best, striving when, when you hear the word preached or you read the word yourself, you're conforming yourself to the image of scripture to the best of your ability and you're moving forward. God's going to bless you, okay? But if you are not, he is going to course correct you. You can call that a curse. You can call it a covenant consequence. But it's just like when my children aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, I give them a little course correction. Right? So, but the point is, is there is no neutral. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. There's no God understands my heart. That's not in there, folks. Obey and be blessed disobey and be cursed there is no neutral this covenant structure is seen more clearly in malachi 3 than anywhere else and malachi 3 is talking about what i'm going to be talking about for the rest of the sermon malachi 3 6 through 12 i meant for ray just to read 6 through 12 and i made him read three extra verses sorry about that brother ray apologize for i the lord do not change Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts." Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And so this idea of covenant structure, covenant blessings and curses, this is actually where we got our, our um, the, the covenant system that sets up our legal foundations as well. You go back to the feudal days or even the American War for Independence. The reason that we were able to declare independence from Britain is based off this same covenant structure. But what's interesting is this is a earthly covenant so there's two parties that can break the covenant. And so we were in covenant with uh, King George, the King of England. We, uh, the colonies, were in covenant. And in that covenant, uh, the Lord versus the vassals, if you will, the Lord has certain responsibilities to provide for and protect the vassals. And the vassals, for that provision and protection, serve the Lord. And it's this covenant thing. And, and when either party begins to break that, um, there's, there's means for breaking that covenant. And that's what the Declaration of Independence was. Thomas Jefferson wrote um, a long list of injuries and usurpations. What he was saying is this is how King George broke the covenant. And he's done it. And we have tried everything we could do to remedy this so that we could get back in covenant. He refused to do it despite all our attempts and all the letters we've written and everything we've done. And because he is not fulfilling his end of the covenant, what we're doing is we're breaking those bonds and we're creating a new government here, okay? But the idea of this, co this, this covenant, wherever you find it is, is master and slave, husband and wife, whatever it is, is the person who has authority has a responsibility to provide and protect the one who's told to submit. And the one who's told to submit, they have to submit, but in that, they're going to be provided for and protected, right? This is this covenant structure that exists. And the beauty is, in, in covenants with God, guess who's never going to fail to fulfill and be faithful to the covenant? He will always provide. He will always protect. He will always be there. He will supply all of your needs. There is no covenant breaking in him. 
And so this is a perfect covenant, and the only one that can break it is guess who? Us, okay? And when we, when we obey, the blessings from that covenant structure, right, come. We're, we're, we're faithful, and so he's blessing us. And again, that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect or without trials and tribulations, but you will be blessed, and if you don't, you will feel it. Okay. <clears throat> Perhaps that is why some of the most controversial, controversial positions in the church today are the things that will cost more than some folks are willing to pay, but they're also linked with tremendous blessing. Wives leaving the career path to make their homes their primary focus in ministry, specifically women with young children. Okay? That is a controversial thing in our society that most folks aren't willing to pay that price because you're losing a paycheck and you feel that and no one else in the culture is doing it. I'm looking at my Cosmopolitan magazine and it turns out stay-at-home mom is not in vogue, okay? <clears throat> Marriages open to an abundance of children if they're physically able. Keeping your children out of public school and tithing. I've never met a single family who studied the scriptures in these areas and sought to submit themselves to the Bible's teaching by faith that has regretted pursuing this path. These are not popular positions, but consequently they are foundational to the building of Christ's kingdom here on this earth. Think about those things. So if we have this Gnostic view of the kingdom, that it's this ethereal thing that's just out there, all you need to worry about is drinking your coffee and reading your Bible and, and fighting some sin in your life, okay? But I don't believe that's what we've been called to. I believe that we've been called to usher in Christ's kingdom here on this earth to whatever degree there's argument between that, but we have a responsibility to a real kingdom that's really here on this earth. We just read, I think, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it's this idea that we're, we're trying to bring earth into submission to King Jesus. How do we do that? Well, if, you're, if, if, if women are working and you're putting your kids in daycare, you're not, you don't have a leg up on it. I can assure you of that. But it costs. It's hard. It's challenging to do that. It's a huge sacrifice. Marriage, is, marriage uh, open to an abundance of children if they are physically able. God, you know, the Lord is the Lord of the womb. He gives, he opens and closes the womb. It's up to him. But this, this, this heart that's open to as many children as God can give you that you're physically able, um, this is how we bring arrows that we launch into the world and in and, and, and our offensive weapons, keeping your children out of public school, which is this idea of keeping your children, really, because the public schools have gotten so bad. Um, again, I'm just saying stuff that's very common in our church, but um, it's this idea of, of family. What this all, the, these three things are really all about is the, the family unit as an offensive weapon, right? And, and doing this the way that, that God says, and then obviously tithing, okay, um, is how the church is built up. And the church and the family is the engine that restores culture here on earth, okay. Spend more time on that than I meant to. So, covenantal obedience in all areas, but specifically these areas that affect your pocketbook and go against cultural norms will be blessed. It requires faith to obey in these areas because the financial ramifications are real and we have a society that encourages us to do the opposite. Not obeying in these areas has cost the church and our society dearly, causing massive generational damage that we are witnessing every single day. Okay. So believing that God blesses obedience is not the prosperity gospel. This is where Reformed folks really, we got two, two issues that I think plague, plague Reformed folks. Is it like the Holy Spirit's another thing you look at kind of squinty-eyed because you see those people like falling all over the place with snakes and stuff. And you're like, eh. I think I can just do with God and Jesus. I don't know about this Holy Spirit character. Right? And, 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 and the Holy Spirit is what drives the entire Christian walk and faith but we're like, yeah, I don't know, because we see this, this horrible abuse of the Holy Spirit and the doctrine surrounding who the Spirit is and, and what he does. And the other one is, is that we are, have so seen the Kenneth Copelands and the Joel Osteens and all of these people say and use real scripture that says what it says. If you sow a seed, you'll be blessed. 
you know, just give right here and God will, you know, open up. The, it was, well, the, the Bible does say that, but they're taking out of context and abusing it. And when we see that abuse, we know deep within our soul that what they're saying is wrong and it's evil and it's perverted and it's wicked. And so we think that we should live in like poverty and that God's not really going to provide for us. And so what we're doing is we're conflating God's abundant provision for his children with prosperity, the prosperity, health and wealth. And these are two separate things. One is true. The other is heresy. God promises to provide for his children. He does not promise health and wealth. God's children will experience trials and tribulations meant to strengthen them. The Bible tells us that Christ was made perfect through suffering. We should have no illusions that the walk of a faithful Christian will be without trials and suffering. So that being said, we should seek to obey him by faith and have confidence that he will meet all of our needs in and through those trials. So back to the main topic of the sermon, which is ultimately the biblical case for Christians to sacrificially give and how much. So there are two schools of thought on sacrificial giving, tithing and grace giving. These are the two main positions. Um, and I'm going to make the case for tithing as I believe that aligns with our church being a covenantal church in the historic reformed tradition. <clears throat> the word tithe literally translates to 10th. I'm just gonna let that sit there for a little bit. Just people are like, well, how many, how many? Tithe means, it means 10th. One out of 10, 10th, 10th, okay? <clears throat> so I am arguing here that Christians are required to give a 10th of their increase. Not if you've got a bunch of money saved up in your bank and you got to give 10% of it every month or whatever time period. No, a tenth of your increase. And that that tenth should go to the church and not parachurch ministries. Ten percent is a minimum. Okay? I've spoken to one of our members that holds to the grace giving position. He says that ten percent is a great place to start, but that Christians should give more. And so there's agreement between both t positions that it's either 10% is required or 10% is a good starting point, but either way, 10%, okay? I am not a specialist on the grace-giving position. That's not my position, but that's okay. Um, and so I'm not going to be able to do it justice up here, but those are the two positions. There's good people in both of those camps, but both positions are saying 10% is where you start, okay? Okay. Some of the pushback I have heard pertaining to a set amount like 10% is that it takes away from the spontaneity of giving as the Lord leads. I disagree. You could spontaneously give 12% one day. Spontaneously. Okay. So, or you could give to some cause in need. So you're giving the church 10%. And then you see someone with a flat tire that can't afford it and you give them money to fix their flat tire. You can still be, you know, benevolent, philanthropic, whatever you want to call that word, while still paying you 10%, right? The two are not. And then you don't get the tire and then be like, all right, well, the church gets the paid for the tire, basically, right? Like, no, 10%. Anyway, I think you guys get what I'm saying. So I know this is a controversial subject. I try not to preach on anything except those. It's kind of my thing. So, but in all seriousness, this is an incredibly important topic, both for the health of the church and also the health of its members. I believe the Bible is crystal clear on the subject, and I'm going to dive into that now. Um, so th what is interesting here, a lot of the pushback on tithe, tenth, is that, well, tithes come from the Mosaic Covenant within the nation state of Israel, okay? Well, that's not true. The first time the concept of tithing shows up is pre-Israel, pre-Mosaic Covenant, okay? And this is where I'm going to base my entire case is off of one instance that happened in the Old Testament before Israel was ever established, and it paints such a clear picture of our response to Christ that it's, it's to me, it's, it's undeniable, Genesis 14, 17 through 20. After his, that would be Abraham's, return from the defeat of Chedlamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him 
at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Okay, that matters, and we'll get back to why. He was priest of God Most High and blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. That's key. Heaven, anyway. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abraham gave a tenth of everything, of the spoils, of his increase. Think of the picture painted here. By God's grace, Abraham, with his 318 trained men, defeated the pagan kings who kidnapped Lot. He destroyed the kings of the earth. Abraham, the father of the faithful, destroys the kings of the earth with 318 trained men. And then Abraham takes all the spoils of the great battle. And upon his victory, Melchizedek, the priest king, king of righteousness and king of peace, appears out of nowhere and serves Abraham bread and wine. Or Welch's grape juice, either one. But bread and wine, okay? That's incredible. I'm going to read an excerpt from Pastor Rich Lusk, who's kind of a friend of our church, uh, a friend of mine, and a friend of Pastor Brandon's. Um, on this passage and break it down. This is really good. After Abraham routed the pagan kings who had captured Lot, Melchizedek, king of Salem, came forth and served Abraham bread and wine. In response, Abraham gave to Melchizedek a tithe out of the plunder he had won. Melchizedek is a somewhat mysterious figure who appears out of nowhere in the book of Genesis. His name literally means king of righteousness and peace. Because he combines the priestly and kingly offices, he is clearly a type of Christ or a pre-incarnate Christophany. This helps bring the tithing question into sharper focus. And so a Christophany, I'm going to fail miserably at explaining this, but it's the idea of every time you see uh, a person who's an angel of the Lord or some type of a figure that doesn't have genealogy or you don't know where they came from is a Christophany or a type of Christ. Some people would say that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate Christ. But either way, uh, he's either a type of Christ or he's a pre-incarnate Christophany um, because he is a priest and a king and he has no genealogy. Lust then quotes A.W. Pink. But not only was Melchizedek a type of Christ, but Abraham was also a typical character or a typological character seen there as the father of the faithful. And we find he acknowledged the priesthood of Melchizedek by giving him a tenth of the spoils which the Lord had enabled him to secure in vanquishing those kings. As Abraham is the father of the faithful, so he left an example for us, his children, to follow in rendering tithes unto him whom Melchizedek was a type. Lust goes on to say, New covenant believers are children of Abraham. As such, we are to walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham. Likewise, we are represented by a priest of the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, who now feeds us bread and wine, but it's his own body and blood in the Lord's Supper. It seems inescapable that we are bound to do as Abraham did, set aside a tenth of our increase for the Melchizedekal priesthood or the priesthood of Melchizedek. To simplify it, we are Abraham's offspring, Galatians 3.29 says, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So we're Abraham. Jesus Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7. Abraham gave a tenth of his increase to the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, we should give a tenth to Christ's church. Do you see where I'm going with this? Does it make sense? Picking up what I'm putting down. All right. So here we see again the importance of assuming continuity between the Old and New Testaments. This is a clear picture of who we are and who Christ is. Hebrews 7 talks about the distinction between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Brother Ray read that um, before he did the prayer of illumination. Specifically, the supremacy of Melchizedek as an eternal priest compared to Levitical priests who were not. 
A case could be made that the sacraments of the Levitical priesthood are the blood of bulls and goats, but the sacraments of the priest of Melchizedek are bread and wine. And in that first ever recorded service of that superior priesthood, bread and wine was offered as well as a blessing, and in response, a tithe was given. That sounds like it could have been the first ever church service. Think about that. Father of the faithful. Anyway, you guys see the picture, right? And so uh, blessing was given, as was communion, and the response was tithe. And so that brings me to my next point I want to make is that tithing is a form of worship. It's set apart as part of our liturgy. It's how we respond. And so sometimes we have, when we read our church covenant, there's the part that Brother Ray reads, and then there's the part that's in bold that we read. And it's this idea of worship is a call and a response. It's not a, a, a rock show and a TED talk, right? Which is what our society has kind of dribbled into. That's not it. It's, a, it's an interactive thing where it's call, response, call, response, okay? And one of the ways that we respond as Abraham did, is, is through giving. And that's why it's set apart. It literally says in our liturgy somewhere in here where it says uh, offering and announcements. And Pastor Brandon always says this is the part of our service where we sacrifice or give financially. This is something we get to do. We get to do. Oftentimes when you think about someone teaching on tithing, you think of someone wagging their finger saying, you better tithe or else, Okay. That's not it at all. I'm inviting you to participate in one of the most incredible opportunities in the world where the creator of the universe to each individual believer says, test me. It's usually not a good idea to test God. But, the, but this is an area where he says, I know this is hard. I know this is challenging, but test me and see what I do. And here's the deal. Some, a lot of people are uncomfortable with teaching on tithing. But here's the deal. I have seen and experienced this so real in my life that if I know as a Christian that this is what the word of God says and that if you do this, you will be blessed beyond your while. And again, not, not, not in monetary. It doesn't mean you're going to be rich. It doesn't mean you get to buy a mansion. But you will be blessed because of this. And if you don't, you will be cursed. Why would I not come and tell you, hey, you guys should probably be doing this, right? Malachi 3, 10 through 12. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the yield, or excuse me, in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And so imagine living in an agrarian society where we know and understand that you can go and you can plow and you can plant and you can pray, but God might not bring the rain. Well, he's saying, bring me the tithes. You'll, you're going to get fruit. Okay. So anyway, we're invited to bring a significant amount of our money to the altar. And in doing so, we have the privilege of interacting with the creator of the universe. Think about that. He's inviting us to interact with him. We are trusting that by obeying in a very tangible way that God will provide for us in a tangible way. And when this happens, it strengthens our faith. So here it is. Every person, when they come under conviction that they need to be doing this, is going to look at their finances and say, it doesn't look good. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And that's where faith comes in. And you obey, and I can't tell you the millions of stories I've heard from people that went ahead and obeyed and then watched as God brought supply from everywhere else or a savings here or whatever um, over and over and over again. And so that, that re this really is, we as uh, finite creatures and beings here on this earth are invited through worship of him to bring finances to him and say, God, if you don't do something, I'm in serious trouble. And then watch him act. And that strengthens your faith because you interacted with the creator of the universe and you watched him act in a very personal way that you got to see and your life will change because you now can trust God more and more and more. 
When we tithe, we will see God bless us not only monetarily, but in blessings money could never buy, and our desire will be for God. And another simple way I've heard it put is, would you rather have a blessed 90% or a cursed 100%? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you um, for this opportunity to be able to interact with you in this unique way um, of bringing something that's so close and so real to us, our finances, uh, our provision to you and offering it up to you and then watching you work in our lives. Uh, we thank you for this gift. I pray that you would um, work on the hearts of those who may be struggling in this area, um, that they may participate and see that the Lord is good uh, and that you are faithful, Lord, uh, and that you will supply all of our needs. Help us to follow you. Help us to be blessed and not cursed. Help us to love you. Help us to be as faithful to you as you are to us in that covenant faithfulness that we see that you are perfect and we are always lacking, always repenting and seeking to do your will. Lord, we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.